A freak wood chipper accident shocked the friends and family of a small community. However, the subsequent revelations were even more startling. A complex love quadrangle lay at the heart of the incident. This twist, which was unexpected by all, shed light on a woman at its very center, who was described by her friends as possessing an uncanny power over men. Captivated by her irresistible charm, these men would go to any lengths to please her, even if it meant doing the unthinkable. Stay with us till the end to learn how it all unfolded. Interrupted Peace Sunday, November 12th, 2017 In Gumburian, Queensland, Australia A peaceful small town of 500, just two hours north of Brisbane by car. The sun had set early, as it often did this time of year. Sharon Baton returned home, exhausted from her travels, and first greeted the three men, Roser, Koenig, and Saunders, who had kindly volunteered this weekend, as they had for the last two, to help clear trees, plants, and other vegetation on her property. Sharon Baton took some pain medication for her aching back and retired to bed early, hoping to get some much-needed rest. At around 7.45 p.m., she was awoken by the frantic and loud barking of her dog. She got out of bed and stepped outside to investigate when exactly had set her dog off. Outside, she noticed two of the men walking up to her. They looked troubled. One of the men, Roser, stopped in his tracks, bent over, clutching his stomach, and vomited. Meanwhile, the other man, Koenig, stumbled up to her veranda, his face ashen and pale. There's been an accident, Kona gasped. Saunders is dead. Now completely in shock, Sharon froze for a moment and asked him to repeat, not believing her ears. Saunders is dead, they confirmed. But how, she asked. The witch of her, he fell in, Roser said, before vomiting again. Sharon immediately rushed to report the freak accident as both men, who were still in shock, had not yet eluded the authorities. Within minutes, police and ambulance services were on the scene. Upon arrival, they were greeted by a horrifying sight. Inspector Algi, a seasoned officer, later remarked it was one of the worst scenes he had ever witnessed. Bruce Saunders, a man well known to the community, was found in the wood chipper. Only his legs remained visible from the feeder tray. The rest of him had been reduced to pulp by the grinder. The chipper spared nothing but his two legs. Saunders was intertwined with the machinery. His blood, body fluid, and other pieces had been spat out the other end, some over a great distance. Quote, It was actually quite horrific. His friends discovered him as he became entangled and attempted to extract him from the shredder, but they were unable to. They're obviously quite traumatized now. Inspector Algi said at the time. According to the men, they were all busy, and it happened so fast. Quote, Don't know what happened. It happened so quick. A, oh my God, I just can't believe it, Roser said. Roser explained that Saunders worked hard, but carelessly, around the machine. Quote, All day we were on to him about it. You just can't tell him, A. You just couldn't tell him anything. Quote, Every time you looked around... He was trying to shove things in the chipper. And I was like, no, stay away from it. Pete and I can handle it. It's a really dangerous machine. It chews it up really quick. The news of the incident sent shockwaves through the small community. It was understandable. After all, this was a small town where both knew each other on a first-name basis. The question on everyone's mind was, how did this happen? Wood chippers can be dangerous. But is it so easy to trip and fall into one? Indeed, wood chippers are dangerous machines. While fatalities are rare, they do occur. According to the American Journal of Industrial Medicine, there were 113 wood chipper related deaths from 1982 to 2016. Saunders had helped prevent this wood chipper, and all three men had received training to use it. However, no amount of training can be of help if not applied correctly. Allegedly, carelessness was at the root cause of this freak accident. The Life of Bruce Saunders Bruce Saunders was known for his ever-present smile and generous spirit. 
A pillar of the community, he was always ready to extend a helping hand and was loved by friends and family. He owned a Bundaberg butcher's shop, which was a part of his family's business for three generations. However, his life was marked by love and loss. After a loving marriage of 22 years that ended with his first wife's passing from cancer, Bruce found himself longing for companionship. His heart was open and yearning for love. Through an online dating app, he met Sharon Graham. According to his friends, he had fallen deeply in love with her. Bruce was an old-fashioned man of romance. He lavished Sharon Graham with gifts and did everything he could to please her. Things were going really well between them. Bruce bought a house for them in the town of Nambour, an hour north of Brisbane. Sharon Graham was not working at the time, but for Bruce, this was about love, not matching finances. Miss Graham was devastated by the news of Bruce's passing. Apparently, she had high blood pressure and almost fainted when one of the men called to notify her of Bruce's untimely death. The men even called an ambulance to take her to the hospital. That day from the hospital, she posted on Facebook, quote, Devastated, I lost the love of my life. She also texted her friend, quote, Can't talk, I'm devastated. Bruce has passed away. He was texting me when his phone must have dropped into the wood mulcher, and he must have gone to grab it. Miss Graham and Miss Baton, both shared the same first name, Sharon, were also best friends, and Graham had offered her male friends to Baton to help her the vegetation on her property. They were now all connected through the loss of Bruce Saunders. December 1st, 2017, was a day of mourning at the funeral of Bruce Saunders. No one seemed more devastated than Sharon Graham. She sat in the front row next to Saunders' son, who had to console her as she cried hysterically. She requested that Bruce's ashes be split, with her receiving half. On the day, she left a message at the funeral home. Quote, Today is the saddest day to say my goodbyes to a beautiful man, Bruce. He treated me like gold. Nothing in this world would be too much for Bruce to do. He smiled every day without a care in this world. His love for me was bigger than anything in this world. He never stopped wanting to do for me. I'm so lost without you, Bruce. No words can express what I'm feeling. He will always be in my thoughts and heart, Bruce. XX. However, things were far from how they seemed. Whispers of Deceit In the aftermath of the incident, the phone lines of the Gimpy detective's office began to buzz with calls. People he knew Saunders started to voice their suspicions, suggesting that his death might not have been an accident. Shara Baton's granddaughter was one of the first to call. She shared that Miss Graham had often talked about how much money Saunders had. Graham had chillingly stated, he would die first and I would get everything. Detectives learned that months earlier, on August 16th, 2017, Saunders had taken out a 750000 Australian dollar or half a billion dollars U.S. life insurance policy, making Sharon Graham the sole beneficiary. It was revealed that Graham and Saunders had recently broken up, but continued to live together in separate rooms. Also, during the time of Saunders' death, Graham had been in a relationship with one of the other men, Gregory Roser. She had also been dismissive of Saunders' attempts to win her back, reportedly laughing to acquaintances about his pathetic pleading text messages. The police learned that Graham had moved into and even slept in the master bedroom the night of Saunders' freak accident, and just two days after his passing, Gregory Roser, a truck driver who lived in his caravan, also moved into Saunders' house. The police immediately opened a possible homicide investigation and began by interviewing everyone involved. Graham said to a friend, quote, It's not my fault he loves me and wants to give me everything. This statement, coupled with the knowledge that Saunders was in debt at the time of this passing, that barred heavily to fund Graham's lifestyle, led detectives to realize that due to his life insurance policy, Saunders was worth more financially in Beth than he was at the time of his demise. The Raid February 2018 Police raided the Gumburian property. With a crew of 40, they meticulously investigated the woodchipper and surrounding area, 
They discovered vertical bloodstains on the machine that were inconsistent with how Bruce Saunders would have fallen in, suggesting he was bleeding before he entered the machine. We're conducting a more thorough search of the area where the wood chipper was, said Wide Bay Burnett District Detective Inspector Gary Pettiford. All up, there's about 160 square meters that we're searching. It's methodical, painstaking work. The machine was also ruled out as being at fault, with Inspector Pettiford confirming it was set up in such a way that if a user fell, they could not be pulled straight into it as Bruce had been. From their investigation, they ruled out the property owner, Sharon Baton, as having any involvement. Meanwhile, calls continued to pour in. Karen Armstrong, a former colleague, revealed that a cheerful Saunders had once confided in her about Graham's abusive behavior. Christina Grills, another colleague, echoed those sentiments, saying Saunders had told her that Graham was domineering and controlling. Most chilling of all was Graham's claim that she had a former partner who knew people and who knew how to make someone disappear. Detectives decided to take a deeper look into Sharon Graham. Sharon had introduced Gregory as Roger to Bruce at the time, so he wouldn't suspect they were dating. Roger lived in a caravan, but Sharon preferred to stay at her home in Bruce's house. Police learned that she had also been in a previous relationship with Peter Koenig. He was also a truck driver by profession. They had met when she lived in South Australia, and she had another ex-partner at the time. They had previously been intimate on multiple occasions. He had taken nude pictures of her and had complained that their relationship was largely nothing more than a tortured friendship. As the investigation unfolded, it became clear that Sharon Graham was not just a figure in the background, but a puppeteer pulling the strings in a deadly game of love and betrayal. The surveillance and the search. In the wake of the shocking revelations, the police decided to tap the house that Sharon Graham and Gregory Roser were staying in. The house, once a symbol of Bruce's love for Sharon, was now a focal point in the investigation of his gruesome death. The police hoped that the surveillance would shed light on Sharon's actions and interactions, providing crucial evidence in the case. Meanwhile, the detectives turned their attention to Roser's caravan. Nestled in Deception Bay, the caravan was a humble abode that held secrets of its own. The search yielded a trove of evidence that further implicated Roser and Graham in the crime. Among the items discovered were documents in both Roser's and Graham's handwriting. These documents contained details about Saunders' work schedule, his car, and even the location of his usual parking spot. One chilling note read, 3.30 to 4 a.m. has to be there before he wakes up suggesting a premeditated plan to ambush Saunders. The search also revealed a timeline that coincided with Graham's planned travel dates to Adelaide. The note mentioned specific dates, 14 to 23rd July, which matched the dates when Graham had booked her flights. The interrogation. As the evidence mounted, the police brought in the two men at the center of the investigation. Gregory Roser and Peter Koenig. During the interrogation, the detectives presented the evidence found in Roser's caravan. The documents detailing Saunders' daily routine, the note about the ambush, and the timeline matching Graham's travel dates were laid bare. The detectives watched closely as the men reacted to the evidence. The detectives then confronted Koenig with the vertical blood splatter found on the wood chipper which contradicted the initial story of an accidental fall. Koning had initially claimed that a branch had fallen on Saunders, causing his fatal injuries. However, when pressed on the improbability of the scenario, given the bloodstained patterns, Koning's composure began to falter. Under the weight of the evidence and the relentless questioning, it was Koning who cracked first. He confessed to his involvement in the crime, revealing the horrifying details of Saunders' murder. According to Koenig, Roser had struck Saunders on the head with a steel binder bar. Once Saunders was dead, they carried his body to the wood chipper. The machine, which was meant to clear vegetation, was used to cover up their heinous act.
Koning also confessed that their initial plan involved a gun and an ambush. They had planned to shoot Saunders on his way to work. However, their plan was never carried out. Instead, they decided to use the wood chipper, leading to the gruesome incident that claimed Saunders' life. The confession was a pivotal moment in the case, as it provided the detectives with the missing piece of evidence they needed to solve the murder. The Arrest and a Verdict The confession from Koenig was the breakthrough the detectives needed. Armed with the damning evidence, they swiftly made the arrest. Sharon Graham, Gregory Roser, and Peter Koenig were taken into custody, marking the beginning of a new chapter in this chilling saga. The trial was set for July 2022. The courtroom buzzed with anticipation as the defendants were let in. The evidence was presented meticulously, painting a grim picture of manipulation, deceit, and cold-blooded murder. The phone calls, the documents found in Roser's caravan, and most importantly, Koning's confession, were all laid bare for the jury to consider. As the trial progressed, more incriminating details emerged. A friend of Graham's came forward, revealing that Graham had asked her to write a letter for insurance purposes. A week or two after Bruce's death, Graham asked me to write a letter to her lawyer, the friend testified. Graham had claimed that Mr. Saunders had left everything to her. The friend was asked to confirm that she and Bruce were in a relationship at the time of his death, which was crucial for the insurance claim. However, the friend refused, stating, no, because it wasn't true. In a shocking revelation during the trial, a new individual, Barry Collins, who had also dated Sharon Graham, testified that she had once joked about wanting to kill Saunders. Collins recounted how Graham casually mentioned that someone was going to get hurt while clearing land weeks before the incident. He initially dismissed the statement as a dark joke, and only realizing its sinister significance when news of the tragedy reached him. Koenig, a key witness in the Crown's case against Graham, pleaded guilty to a charge of accessory after the fact to murder. He had been in custody since an arrest in 2018. Koenig's murder charge was subsequently dropped, and he was released from jail after receiving a suspended sentence. In exchange for his release after some four years in pre-sentence custody, he gave evidence against Roser and Graham at their respective murder trials. Roser was convicted by a jury of Mr. Saunders' murder after pleading not guilty to the charge. He was sentenced to life in prison. His role in the crime, as revealed by the evidence and Koenig's testimony, was undeniable. In October 2023, the final verdict was delivered. Sharon Graham, the woman at the center of this twisted tale, was found guilty of murder. Supreme Court Justice Martin Burns, who had also presided over the pre-trial hearings and Roser sentencing, summed up the kind of person Graham was in his sentence. By my observations, you have displayed the hallmarks of deep-seated psychopathy, Judge Burns said. If at any point the authorities seriously consider your release, I ask that they keep that observation firmly in mind. Graham was sentenced to life in prison. The woman who had once charmed men with her beauty was now behind bars, paying the price for her heinous crime. What was it about Sharon? How did she have this power over men? I don't know what power she had, but there was just something about her. There was an, an aura about her that would just draw people in. And the quiet suburb of Gumburian could finally breathe a sigh of relief. Justice, though delayed, had been served. The aftermath. The trial's conclusion sent ripples through the community of Gumburian. The once tranquil suburb had been the stage for a chilling tale of love, betrayal, and murder. The residents who had watched the events unfold with bated breath could finally find some closure. Bruce Saunders' son, Blake, was amongst those most affected by the trial's outcome. The verdict brought the sense of justice, but it did little to fill the void left by his father's untimely demise. 
He had to grapple with the harsh reality that the woman he had once consoled at his father's funeral was the architect of his father's death. Sharon Baton, whose property had been the scene of the gruesome crime, also felt the weight of the trial's conclusion. She had lost the friend in Bruce Saunders and had been betrayed by another friend, Sharon Graham. The trial had revealed the true face of Graham, a woman she had once considered a sister. The trial's conclusion also marked the end of a long and arduous journey for the detectives who had worked tirelessly on the case. Their dedication and commitment had ensured that justice was served, bringing a sense of closure to the community. The friends and family were devastated through the trial, but it was Miss Graham's ex-friend, Sharon Baton, who had the most startling remark. She said she had treated Graham as a sister. I defended you when everyone said that you were involved in Bruce's death. I kept thinking, no way, I know her. She's a Christian. She wouldn't take someone's life like that, Miss Baton's victim compact statement said. It's hard to believe that you would arrange to do such a thing. When I sit and think about things, Bruce was more of a friend to us than you could ever be, as no true friend would do what you have done, and on our property. Miss Baton revealed she had a complete breakdown. She couldn't trust anyone. She never left the bedroom of a daughter's home. She confided only in her dog, Hope. She shows some compassion and unconditional love, which you lack. You showed no empathy, no emotion, no compassion for others. Miss Baton said of Graham, You stole my sense of trust in humanity, that I could not put myself into a position of opening up to others. I wish I had never met you. Where are your friends now, Sharon? They have all gone. This chilling tale serves as a stark reminder of the dark side of human nature. It shows us what individuals under the influence of manipulation can do. The story of Bruce Saunders' tragic death underscores the devastating consequences of deceit and betrayal. If you found the story compelling, please like, share, and subscribe. Your support helps us bring more such stories to light. Stories that need to be told. Stories that remind us of both the darkness and the resilience of the human spirit. Now, go check out some of our other cases, such as the one on the left, of a banker who lost his mind and committed an unspeakable crime.